All right, school is in session. So take your seats and turn up the volume. volume. It's time for the smartest fishing show on the internet. This is the show that dives into everything fishing from tactics and gear to policy and product. Here he is, the fishing professor, Professor Sid Dobrin. So stick around, you might learn something. My pappy said, son, you're going to drive me to drink it if you don't stop driving that hot rod Lincoln. Have you heard this story of the hot rod race when Fords and Lincolns were setting the pace? That story is true, I'm here to say. I was driving that Model A, and I'm driving the Rodcast because I am Sid Dobrin, the fishing professor. Glad you came along for the ride. Welcome to the show. Man, you got to love Commander Cody and the Lost Planet Airmen. Just a fantastic group. I've had a couple of their albums since I was a teenager. Hey, did you know that Commander Cody just recently died? Yeah, in September of 2021. What cracks me up now is that if you refer to Commander Cody, everyone assumes you're referring to CC2224 Commander Cody from Star Wars, the clone army commander from Clone Wars. But that's not the Commander Cody. The Commander Cody from Commander Cody and the Lost Planet Airmen was the stage name for George Frayn. He took the name as homage to that great 1950s science fiction film character from two different 12-episode science fiction serials made by Republic Pictures. These were the Rocket Man serials. I think the first one was called Zombies of the Stratosphere, and the other one was Radar Men from the Moon, both of which were made in 1952. Yeah, just kind of think of that original Flash Gordon series from way back when, not that 1980s uh, movie, but you get the idea from that 1952 kind of feel of science fiction. Anyway, Commander Cody was played by George Wallace, not the governor, the actor. But I did find an ad from the Alabama Tourist Agency from 1972 feature, featuring a picture of George Wallace, the governor, with a bass and the words, rough it between the clear Alabama sky, taste sizzling catfish fresh off the fire, or try your luck at some of the best largemouth bass fishing in the world. Anyway, George Lucas named the Star Wars character after the George Wallace character because the Commander Cody movies were part of what inspired Lucas and then Commander Cody and the Lost Planet Airmen to play Hot Rod Lincoln and inspired Lucas to uh, to make Star Wars. And I have no idea what kind of chaotic game of 12 degrees of separation I'm getting at, other than to say, they arrested me and they put me in jail and called my pappy to throw my bail. And he said, son, you're going to drive me to drinking if you don't stop listening to that Hot Rod cast. See what I did there? How's that for bringing it home after what seemed like an unguided ride? Hey, so welcome to the Rodcast, where we'll definitely drive you to drinking this week, because I've got my good buddy Sam Snyder, formerly of Trout Unlimited, who spent years working against the proposed pebble mine in Bristol Bay, not to mention the fact that he is a fanatic trout angler, and this week he's in the inshore offshore studio. And after Sam and I talk trout and pebble mine, I'm going to get into a bottle of Clyde May straight rye. And then I'm going to count down my top 10 landing nets for use from the boat. Hey, speaking of nets, did you know that humans started using nets to catch fish as far back as the Stone Age? The oldest known net, which is commonly called the net of Antrea, was dated to be from 8,300 B.C. It was found, along with some other fishing gear, in the town of Antrea in Finland. But the town also has significance to Russia, too. So the Russians started calling it Kamenogorsk in 1946. And the net of Atreya was made from willow. A farmer named Anidi Viloyaranian, or something like that, found it in 1913 in a swamp that had been the Ancleus Lake. Now, interestingly, though, in 2018, someone found fishing net sinkers from 27,000 B.C. in Korea, making them the oldest fishing implements discovered to date anywhere in the world. So we know that humans have been fishing and using fishing nets for at least 30,000 years. And when you hear my top 10 list this week, you had better believe that the nets we're going to talk about are a damn sight more advanced than those 30,000-year-old nets. But I bet, too, that those old nets were a lot more important to the people who relied on them than the ones we are using today. So how's that for a fishing history lesson? And with that, let's get casting. (music) 
All right, my listening crew, we have got another great conversation headed your way. This week, my good friend Sam Snyder joins us on the broadcast. Now, Sam is a diehard trout angler out of New Mexico, who I met back in 2004 when he was a PhD student in the Department of Religion here at the University of Florida. He was working on his dissertation, which was titled Casting for Conservation, Religion, Popular Culture, and the Politics of River Restoration. And so Sam and I started talking about fly fishing and conservation way back when. Now, after completing his degree in 2008, Dr. Snyder moved out to Alaska, where in 2014, he took a job as the Alaska Engagement Director for Trout Unlimited Alaska. And that's a program that collaborates with commercial fishermen, anglers, tribes, chefs, and many others who care about trout and salmon. And their task is to preserve, protect, and restore wild salmon and trout populations throughout the country's largest, wildest, and most fish-rich state. Through that program, TU works to protect some of the most pristine and prized rivers on the planet, and they focus on Bristol Bay in southwestern Alaska, the Susitna River in south central, and the waters of the Tongass National Forest, Forest in southeast. Now, in 2018, Sam left this position and began to work as the Alaska Campaign Manager for the Wild Salmon Center, where he worked until last year. So for 14 years, Sam dedicated his life to fighting against the Pebble Mine in Bristol Bay and their proposed mine discharge plan. And as you may know, just a few weeks ago, the EPA effectively shut down the proposed Pebble Mine plan using a rarely invoked power to restrict development to protect watersheds. And I'm sure we're going to talk to Sam about that decision and about the future of salmon fishing in Bristol Bay, given his personal commitment and professional struggle to prevent the mine from opening. Sam now works for the Seattle-based communications company, True Blue Strategies, and he's also the co-editor of the fantastic book, Backcast, The Global History of Fly Fishing and Conservation. So it is with great excitement that I welcome Dr. Sam Snyder to the Rodcast. Sam, it's so good to see you, man. Thanks for being on the Rodcast. It's so good to see you, too. It's been too long, and it's really wild to know that I first walked into your office in 2004. It's yeah, like, it's been a while. It's a long time ago. We're old, man. <laughs> yeah, it makes me feel old. So um, before we dig into the nitty gritty, I want to kick things off with my traditional opening question. Could you tell us a little bit about your angling origins and how you got interested in fishing, specifically fly fishing and trout and salmon? Yeah, I mean, I think I, mean, I think started fishing probably like visiting my grandfather in central Texas in a tiny town called Brownwood. And it was, you know, catching bass and catfish and perch um but i think you know the the thing that stands out to me most was when we started you know first spending time and then moved to new mexico um but just driving to like these really small streams in new mexico um we would also go to the san juan and um that's when my dad started teaching me how to fly fish um and i think too it wasn't just like the fly fishing uh it was the trips to the the places that stand out to me, the conversations about even like driving past like the, uh, the forest and the, the ranger station where Aldo Leopold briefly worked before he headed over to Arizona. And so sort of piecing this all together. Um, but yeah, so my, I would say that my foundational days on the water were somewhere split between like, uh, bass fishing in central Texas and, and trout fishing in New Mexico in Northern New Mexico. Did you guide when you were in New Mexico? No, I, you know, I know I would be a terrible guide, Sid. I don't think I have the patience to, to guide. I have my cousin as a guide or was a guide for a long time, lots of friends, but no, I, I never guided myself. So you're a communications guy. And for those of us unanointed in the trout fishing of New Mexico, how should we be thinking about New Mexico trout fishing? Oh, man. Uh, I think it's a lot of, you know, a lot of smaller streams, um, a lot of pocket water were my favorite places. Um, some of the smaller streams like the Jemez river, you know, these rivers are not necessarily very wide. They could be like 10 to 20 feet across big boulders in the water. And so you're really, there's a lot of sneaking around. There's a lot of small rods, you know, you're fishing with like a three weight, perhaps, um, very tiny dry flies often, or a dry fly with a dropper, I guess, late summer, you're fishing with like uh, grasshoppers and sort of bigger things. Um, I like sort of the stealth and stalk, you're sneaking up behind them, you're trying to get a good drift, it comes over that boulder, there's nothing more satisfying than like getting, getting a cast sort of up at the top of a boulder. And it's sort of you get that perfect line down, and you know, the fish is hiding out behind it, and you get that rise, or you get the tug below. 
Um, they're not always the biggest fish. I think that's the juxtaposition between, um, you know, New Mexico and Alaska. Alaska, you got big fish, big rods, you know, big, big heavy flies. Um, I will always like prefer sort of the smaller uh, craft, I guess, if you will. Yeah, and a lot of times that difference in the the flies in Alaska also is the a lot of it is aggression strikes rather than feed yeah. strikes too, which is very different from what you're describing in pocket waters. Mm-hmm. hundred mm-hmm. percent. So, so yeah, yeah, I read someplace that fishing in places like the Red or the Hondo River or uh, Pueblo and Castilla Creeks that these are all good, or a lot of places in New Mexico are good good trout fishing for beginners because the trout tend to be dumb there. <laughs> Some of them, yes, it's very much so. Yeah. So, and I think that was great for me as a kid. Cause then, uh, you know, I was able to catch fish, um, and, uh, you know, appreciate the process rather than get bored and be like, ah, oh, this is no fun dad. Um, so yeah, yeah I think they that, might not be very big, but you can catch lots of them sometimes. So yeah, I like the idea of dumb trout that just somehow it <laughs> intrigues me. <laughs> it's, it's pretty great. Yeah. So as part of this origin story, then I want to know uh, what was the impetus then for you to study religion as a way of thinking about fly fishing? Oh man. I mean, I think at first I was just interested in religion. I think growing up, I was always fascinated by why and how people were were religious. I mean, we grew up going to the Catholic church and then the Episcopal church. Uh, I was always, it was a, you know, a community space for me more than like a theological space. So I was always intrigued by how religion generally created, you know, community for folks. Um, And then I think, you know, going through school, I think probably as a freshman, I was just like, oh, I want to take that class. It looks cool. And before I knew it, I was like, oh, I guess I'm going to major in religious studies. But what I found more and more that I was less interested in you know, uh, specific religious traditions, um, and more interested in how religions moved, how cultures sort of bended them and, and, you know, how they worked through text, how they worked through materiality. Uh, if you look at sort of like, you know, religion in the diaspora, how, th- how things moved to create new homes and new places, uh, and stories. And I think this is like the communication question. How do we tell stories about the places that we live, that we make ourselves at home, um, and what language do we use? And I think the more I dove into sort of what to, you know, use a super academic term, the stuff of religion, um, I realized that I was very interested in how, you know, the quote unquote secular world deployed the same sort of habits and practices um, outside of traditional religious spaces to make sense of, of things. You know, that's whether that's uh surfers is sort of like the obvious one right um but then i started looking at you know reading deeply and uh basically taking books off my dad's bookshelf and reading all of this this fishing literature and fly fishing literature and you start to realize that whoa uh some of some folks are writing from a christian perspective about fishing but many are just writing about fishing and start using language of the sacred uh the power you know to talk about the power of the place and the practice uh, meditative language, um, and it's very much borrowing from religion to describe this powerful space. And so I, I think I was, you know, fortunate that I had professors, including you, that weren't like, "Yeah, this is you can't make these connections. This is silly." They were like, "Yeah, this you're this is an interesting sort of nexus. You should keep asking questions about it." Um, so I think, I, you know, I think I, to some degree, I still think I just kind of stumbled into it and was like, "Oh, this is fun," and. But I had, you know, faculty and mentors and professors that were like, you should study the stuff that's fun. Um, Because that's where you're going to find, you know, some real insights. Absolutely. You know, speaking of storytelling, a couple of weeks ago on episode 1.44 of this uh, broadcast, um, I had John Gierak on. And uh, I brought up your arguments about fly fishing as religion, speaking of, you know, one of the great trout storytellers. And I asked him his thoughts about fly fishing as a religion. And he responded that, yeah, some people might see it that way. And that fly fishing could be a religion, but he just sees it as a thing people do. So here we are 15 years after you wrote that dissertation. And suddenly in saying that out loud again, I feel really old. But have your thoughts about our devotions to fly fishing changed? No, I think that to some degree, no, I think that 
and look, I don't know that it is a these are it's a religion, but it fills that space for people, uh, and it it is a meaning making activity. And so, in that regard, yeah, it is very it's like a religion. It is religious like. Uh, I think you know to some degree, I have you know started to look for that elsewhere too. Uh, I think you know as my time in Alaska evolved, I, it was you know yes, I fished and I looked to like find my find that important space and experience in rivers. But I also started to like look towards like up from the rivers and look up at the peaks and the ridges of mountains and started to think about, you know, a skiing them, uh, be, you know, running on them. And all of those things provide that. Uh, I think that space of meaning making and homemaking uh, that I very much believe is, you know, a religious activity. Does your uh, does your musical life tie into that too? Yeah, I think definitely so. Yeah, playing music, being on a stage, like, you, and you get that. There's a, in some ways, that's very different. Like, it's transformative, but in all of them, you lose yourself a little bit. There's a meditation. You feed off your surroundings. Um, yeah, I didn't include a, any of that in, in the intro. I should have pointed out that you, you know, had a band. <laughs> Well, I did, yeah, and you know, play played the great stages in Kirdwood and <laughs> that's right, <laughs> and Talkeetna and <laughs> Hope. That's yeah, hysterical. Huge that's stages. Pretty... So, a tremendous amount of your work in the arena of fishing has been tied to conservation efforts, and I want to talk about that in a second. But first, tell us about the Backcast books, and I'm particularly interested in something you wrote in the introduction to the book about your own personal interest in conservation from a historical perspective. Talk to us about back, Backcast and what the intent was with that book. Oh, man, what was the intent? Uh, I mean, if I'm honest, I think I started wanted to write the book myself, and then we decided to edit it because I thought that editing a book was going to be easier. <laughs> turns out it's not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I should have just written it myself. Um, I mean, I think it, I mean, it's obviously born out of the dissertation, but I think I wanted to, I think so much of the dissertation was focused on contemporary movements. It was looking at existing grassroots environmental movements um, around trout, around rivers and around, you know, fish politics. Um, and I wanted to sort of look and see what the historical, tra historical trajectory was to how people may, you know, sort of negotiated their relationship to the world through fish. And, um, you know, there's so many stories from, uh, you know, the, the famed waters that, you know, the Catskills of the Poconos in the, in the early history of fly fishing to, you know, the steelheaders in the Pacific Northwest who will stand in the cold water and rain and snow for hours and like swing and swing and swing and maybe catch fish. Uh, but when they do, it talk about a religious experience. And so, but I was really, can I think the thing that has always driven me personally and academically and professionally is how do the experiences we have, the stories we tell about those experiences, how do they and how can they drive us to basically give a damn and start spending our time, not just fishing, but also showing up at policy meetings or helping restore streams on the weekend and plant willows, like, you know, advocating for policy at the legislative or the federal level, travel to DC. Like these are things that like you ask people, you go to DC with somebody and you ask them why they're there to advocate for a place like Bristol Bay. Well, they've got some experiential tie to it and they're going to tell you stories about it. And so I was curious, like, what's the historical trajectory here? And come to find out, like, we've been, you know, going through this process for a long time. Um, and so, and, and I think, too, the experiences in these spaces allow, allow over time, allow us to see changes. And so we're like, oh, whether it's climate change or it's stream degradation from, like, logging or paper mills back in the day, there's a recognition over time that something is not the way that it should be. And so you start devoting an energy to understanding it, but it's all rooted in that, that sport. It's all rooted, rooted in the experience and the stories that you're telling about that sport. Yeah. You know, you keep, you keep bringing up this term storytelling and you brought up Leopold a little while ago. And I'm, you know, as I'm hearing you talk, I'm thinking about how much of the world of angling now is tied to conservation. Like it's very hard to mm -hmm. find anglers who are not somehow at least alert to conservation. And I'm kind of wondering from your perspective, how much of that, well, I don't want to use the land ethic term because as I right. talked about, you know, Leopold's land ethic, we tend, we, 
we always want to just translate the terrestrial into the aquatic and it doesn't always work but how much a part of that aquatic conservation has become part of the story of fishing yeah that's a good question i actually struggle a lot with it i i think there was a part of me that wanted to see that it was this increasing path um and i think that and to me that was optimistic this is maybe not the way you want this question to go but i think that i if i look at sort of the politics and the demographics of a lot of anglers, like they're constantly voting and making choices against the well-being of the places that we like to fish. And so I think that when we when we look for the connection between angling and conservation, we see it in a lot of places. But I think that when we look at the cultures as a whole, I'm not sure that it's, you know, that it's necessarily grown any more than it used to be. Yeah, and and I think that that's why the histories that you talk about in Backcast become so important to that narrative is mm-hmm. because we have to recognize that this isn't something new. It isn't right. that you know, anglers, whether they're trout anglers in New Mexico or salmon anglers in Alaska or redfish anglers here in Florida, mm-hmm. we've been having these conversations for quite a while now. Yeah, and I think, you know, Tim, and we tend to, I think the struggle too is we tend the best stories are the collaborative stories, right? And I think at times, sometimes when we approach conservation from a fishing lens, we start to think about how it impacts our fishing rather than the watershed itself, rather than sort of like what the fish need, uh, what the broader community needs. And so I think the more that we can use, and I think to me, this is always what was intriguing about fly fishing in particular is that I believed uh, that it, forced a little bit more of a systemic approach. Now, fly fishers can be arrogant, and I don't know that I totally believe this anymore, but I, but I think that at least for me, it, it taught me, you know, there's a bug, there's a temperature, there's a, you're starting to look at a system. And the more that we can take our fishing to look, to take a systemic view of, of the watershed, there, we're going to see that maybe, you know, conserving a place means that we don't fish there anymore for a while, for example. Um, and you just let the, let the water be. And so I think that's sort of the tug and pull. Are we conserving it because it's good for the place and it's good for the fish? Or are we doing it because uh, it's, it's good for our experience of fishing? Well, those aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. It's like a Venn diagram. And so, but I think we have to understand the nuance there. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And it also, you know, going back to the story, it's also how we're telling that story and the hierarchies we're creating for Mm -hmm. what we see as being worth protected. And that's part of, that's part of the overall angling story, right? You know, the moment you say I'm a fly fisherman for trout, there's a, there's an implied hierarchy of Mm -hmm. my conservation ethic is better than you fisherman kind of guy. Right. Yeah. So totally. Yeah. And I think over time I've like, I was once that guy. And I don't like that guy anymore. And so I think we have to understand that everybody's got a path to this. How do we like, uh, how do we foster it? Yeah, absolutely. I just realized too, because I've got Backcast sitting here on the desk with me that I need to bring my copy over to your place to get you to sign it. Yeah. Uh, I just realized I only have one copy left. So I was like, Oh, do I have a copy to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, I think people don't recognize that when you write a book or edit a book, you don't have an unlimited supply that the press is. You don't No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's take this conversation out to Alaska for a bit in the place that you and I both have a lot of connection and affinity. Mm-hmm. Tell us about me an Alaska engagement director for TU, but I also want to hear the story about how you got that job and the influence the documentary Red Gold had on how you got that job. Red Gold being the 2008 Felt Soul Media documentary about Bristol Bay, not Red Gold, the canned tomatoes. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, what's funny is I, I look back, I mean, there's a, there's a, you know, at the end of my dissertation, there's sort of like a nod to like upcoming fights. And I note the Bristol Bay story because it was intriguing because, you know, as, as my dissertation talks so much about collaboration and how groups of the unalike work together for, you know, political fights for waters and fish, I saw the Bristol Bay story as one that was like, you know, a real potential. Also just recognizing that Bristol Bay being the largest salmon fishery, sockeye salmon fishery on the planet, like if we couldn't protect it and we got, we got real problems. 
Um, so I, there was, a, was some, a familiarity to it. And then the film came out and I showed it, I think, first when I was teaching at Kalamazoo College in Michigan um, briefly. Um, and so when my wife got a job teaching at the University of Alaska um, in Anchorage, uh, she was offered it. We said whoever got the first best job won. She got the best job. Uh, so to Alaska, we went. Um, I literally like started like calling people in in the film. And so Tim Bristol... Uh, who was at the time the director of Trout Unlimited's Alaska program. At first, I was like, yeah, whatever, dude. Uh, he was like, you should go talk to the small nonprofit Renewable Resources Coalition. And so I started working with them um, to start. And, um, you know, I think it had a real, like, baptism, to use religious terms, into uh, Alaska politics, Alaska understandings of water and fish. Uh, I was hired to go work at the Alaska State Fair in Palmer. For 12 days, I hung out at the Alaska State Fair in the summer of 2009 um, and talked to people about the Pebble Mine. I knew it academically. I knew what it was. I knew where it was. I knew what the impacts were. I could rattle off numbers about the fishery. I did not know the fight culturally yet, and I got legend. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of supporters too were like, "Yeah, that's a terrible idea. I think it's bad." But like, you're in, you're in. For those that don't know, Alaska, Palmer, and Wasilla, they're north of Anchorage, and it's definitely like, you know, it's a resource uh, development heavy sort of culture there. And so they were like, "Okay, whatever, man." Um, but it was a real learning experience. But I didn't give up, and I just kept sort of showing up to meetings, and then, and then you know, having a graduate degree helped. Uh, being able to take good notes and write and write grants helped. Uh, and people were like, oh, man, you can do these things. We should hire you more directly. And so that's how I, you know, was hired more effectively into the campaign. And, and really in that Trout Unlimited position worked um, as the campaign coordinator for the um, Bristol Bay fight for a long time. Um, what is that like? On the one hand, it's like it seems glamorous. Um, but uh a lot of it, you know, I think we were having a conversation with somebody about this the other day. And, you know, we we look at the sort of the highlights of these fights and um, but you don't acknowledge like the grunt work. You're I mean, what did I do? I hosted conference calls and I sent emails and I managed budgets and, you know, and the flow of grant money is tedious stuff. Uh, but occasionally I would get to go out to Bristol Bay and and get to fish the waters and catch these rainbow trout that were like, they're just freight trains. They're built different. They just, you know, it, even a 20 inch trout is just, it's going to rip the rod out of your hand and like, see, be like, see you later. Um, so yeah, so that was sort of the, the slight perk of the job. You don't get paid a lot in the nonprofit world, uh, but at least I got to go out to Bristol Bay a handful of times. Yeah. I mean, Bristol Bay has that reputation of, you know, like you said, the richest commercial salmon fishery in the world. But it is also a recreational angler's dream. That stretch oh. along the Algnac, uh, that's mm -hmm. the tributary that runs off Kvach, uh, Kvach, check out. Kvijak. Yeah, Kvijak. Kvijak. Uh, at the northeast of Bristol Bay. That is a remote and fantastic fishery. Talk talk yeah. about fishing that area around the neck, uh, uh, Knack Knack and Lovelock and all those places in the northern parts of the peninsula. Tell me about fishing there. Yeah, I mean, I think probably where I spent got to spend most of my time was on the Knack Knack. It's really big water. So to go from like the tiny waters of New Mexico, you're talking really big water, you know, hundreds of yards across um, and big, slow moving water. Um, you know, that's when I first learned how to cast a spay rod. I'm still not very good at it, but, you know, you can you can you can really when you get it, it feels pretty great. All of a sudden that line goes shooting out there much, uh, you know. Um, and you can cover a lot of ground. Um, and those fish, again, like, uh, you know, the guides, they all the guides know how big these fish are. And of course, you're freaking out. And then they're like, oh, it's not very big. And you're like, whatever, this thing's like, just run me to my backing like four times. What do you mean it's not very big? And then you get it and it's like a 22 inch trout, which is perfectly great trout. And they're like, whatever, it's not like 29 or 30. Um, no, I think the the biggest trout I ever caught in Bristol Bay was probably about 28 and a half and it cracked that 30 mark, but it's, it's the most insane experience. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just freight trains. Um, and I think also just like, it's just, 
it's water for miles. It's wetlands for miles. Um, it's sky for miles. It's kind of, you know, parts of it reminds you of like Montana because it's just like big open sky forever. And then you're fishing at like 11 o'clock at night and the sun's still, you know, mostly overhead. Um, and you have to realize that you need to go eat some dinner or, you know, it's time for a beer. Um, yeah, it's a place like no other. And I think um, it is it is a, the dream of sportsmen to go to places like Bristol Bay for a reason. Um, because these, there's just so many fish, and there's so many salmon, and there's so many eggs, and there's the trout that are hanging out behind them, and the Dolly Vard. And like, it just, it's it's an ecosystem as it one as you know, many of these ones were, and it's still there just functioning basically as it should. You know, yep. there, there is something I have to say, you mentioned it. There's something that's just fantastic about taking a Dolly Varden at 1 AM and realizing it's broad daylight. Yeah. It's just so much fun. Hey, I want to, I want to come back to Pebble Creek and Bristol Bay in just a second, but yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to interlude here with something you said, because I caught this the other day. Um, this is completely a non sequitur, but you, you mentioned it, I love about, it, you know, about, um, about Wasilla and Palmer uh, where, where there's a red robin now, which drives me absolutely crazy. Yeah. But um, there was an Arby's commercial for their fish sandwich. And the commercial says Alaska's got a lot of great fish, but potatoes, not so much. And I'm thinking, have you not been to Matsu Valley? The greatest potatoes yeah. in the country. Yeah, there's potatoes there. Yeah, they're fantastic. So let's talk about um, Pebble Creek a bit. Um, back in May of 2022 you appeared on the american sport fishing association's podcast the politics of fish you know, which is hosted by mike leonard a good friend of mine he's mm -hmm. the vice president of asa's government affairs team and someone i have a tremendous amount of respect for he was on the broadcast back in episode 1.20 by the way and yes. mike told me that his wife finds my singing and goofiness on the broadcast to be very odd but um <laughs> <laughs> you, you talked with mike about pebble mine so talk to us about the Pebble Mine Creek situation. And because it's been, the ruling just happened a couple of weeks ago. What, yeah. what does this actually mean for Bristol Bay? And what are the long-term impacts and possibilities of this new ruling by the EPA? Yeah. Oh man. So I don't try and give you like the super cliff notes. Uh, so for those that don't know, Pebble Mine is a proposal for the largest, one of the largest open pit copper and gold mines uh, in North America. Uh, at the headwaters of Bristol Bay um, and Bristol Bay being the largest salmon fishery, sockeye salmon fishery on the planet. We're talking what last year, 88 million sockeye returned, like just we just can't even wrap our head around. Right. And we can catch half of them and the system keeps functioning the way that it, that it does. These feed trout for the sportsmen, they feed bears for the bear viewers. Uh, and of course they, they have, you know, supported indigenous peoples on that land for millennia. There's, you know, I think 31 uh, federally recognized tribes in Bristol Bay, um, you know, that are still very much uh, living on that land. And I think, you know, the the ruling by, by EPA is, is huge because it lifts a cloud off their shoulders and they can start thinking about what future looks like for Bristol Bay. Um, in 2010, uh, 10, uh, 13 tribes wrote to EPA and said, you've got this really weird niche uh tool in the clean water act you've only used it 13 times in the history of the clean water act so since what 1972 1973 it's only been used 13 times um where they can come in and, and say basically like we're not going to allow you to you know dig up or, or destroy habitat in a way that affects water quality fishing shellfish beds recreational areas um so if it was like cool this is interesting but we're going to study it for a while. So they studied it for a while between 2011 and 2014, uh, started a process to protect Bristol Bay in under the Obama administration. And then that was stopped under the Trump administration. And then, and this is a super abbreviated version, but then the Biden administration, uh, when, uh, made a commitment to finish the job. And so there was a lot of pressure, uh, led by the tribes supported by sportsmen's organizations, wild salmon center, trout unlimited, uh, other regional entities, um, salmon state, um, and then commercial fishermen, uh, in this huge industry there to $2.2 billion a year fishery, commercial fishery. Um, so there's a lot of power there pushing on the EPA. Um, and so they restarted the process and, 
finalize this decision. Now, I think the thing that's important to note is that uh, it, this tool is like a scalpel. Um, there are some that want to see the whole watershed protected, but it's complicated. It's, it's A, it's the area bigger than West Virginia. Uh, it's, um, uh, it, it's a mismatch of federal and state land. These are federal waters, which is why EPA has jurisdiction here. Um, but this, this tool that the, that the EPA used in the Clean Water Act, it's like a scalpel. And so what they basically did is they drew one small circle around where the pebble mine would be and sort of around that deposit. And they're like, we will, like from here forward, any disruption of this is prohibited. Like you can, you can rename it, you can try and resize it, you can call it something else. Doesn't matter, like activity here, mining activity here is prohibited. And then they drew another circle around that slightly bigger that encompasses a good chunk of the, um, the mining claims that, that Pebble was pursuing um, and said, you know, we're going to place some really hard restrictions here. So if you wanted to do something here, uh, it's going to be really difficult because you're not going to be able to disrupt much water. Um, so they have effectively stopped the Pebble mine. Now Pebble will sue, the state will sue. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Uh, in the courts. The courts have changed a lot over the last couple of years. Um, but so far, the legal record and the, the court record has been strongly in favor of supporting EPA's authority to do this. So I think people are pretty confident that this is going to stick. Um, and and so that's, you know, um, yeah, so we're, we're paying attention to that. Um, but I think you know, this is as durable a protection as you're going to get uh, absent a national monument. And even those can be messed with by Congress or by subsequent administrations and lawsuits. So, you know, none of this is perfect, uh, but Pebble is effectively dead. Um, and now the, the next question is, is what do we do next? There are other mining claims in the watershed. Um, none of them are in advanced discovery, anything like that. They're not an immediate threat, but we'd like to them to go away as well. So there's conversation. Uh, Senator Murkowski has at times talked about pursuing legislation to protect the whole watershed, do so in a way that maybe uh, Alaska sees something in return um, from the federal government, uh, because Alaska's like, hey, this is ours. We should be able to mine this stuff. And um, so it's a complex process. But I think people are now saying, OK, Pebble is dead. Let's think about how we want to like approach the management of this watershed moving forward. Um, uh, and again, I think most importantly, uh, the tribes are at the, at the head of the table and they're saying this is what we do or don't want with our watershed. Uh, these fish have sustained us for millennia. Um, and so, you know, I think we've got a real opportunity to kind of ride the momentum of the win um, and push uh, Congress to start looking at new things. And in addition to S Senator Murkowski, there's also newly elected um, Congresswoman Mary Peltola, who filled seat of Don of the late Don Young. And she's also, you know, she ran on a pro fish uh, platform was the first, like that was her tagline, I'm pro fish. And so she was opposed to Pebble. Uh, she's very much uh, supportive of protecting Bristol Bay and other watersheds. And so you have Mur Senator Murkowski, you have Mary Petola, you have a, you have a duo there that could really do some powerful things for uh, Bristol Bay's fish. Excellent. And a lot of that, the, a lot of the Bristol Bay argument was around the discharge plan from the mine yeah. more so than the actual digging in kind of thing. It was how. Yeah. I mean, it's the management of the waste. So you're going to have 10.78 billion tons of waste. You're going to have uh, dams that are 740 foot tall and several mines holding back this sort of mix of waste rock and slurry uh, that's definitely got sulfuric acid in it. Um, you know, in this place, it's a giant wetland and it's a giant sponge. And um, if you have a tailings dam failure, you have a, you know, a, my, a failure that sends mining waste into the watershed, like the whole system is totally trashed, right? You don't come back from that. Um, and I think, you know, we look at other places, you look at stories like in Backcast and you say, we, fishermen have spent a lot of time fixing places that were messed up. In Bristol Bay, we don't have to fix so let's leave it that way, right? Like, let's not even, like, let's not play that game. So um, I think that's what's really important is now we can start thinking about what it means to continue to maintain this place rather than fighting, you know, this cloud of threat. Yeah, and that's that's so crucial to have that kind of a why wait for the disaster kind of attitude. Yeah. 
I think, you know, to go back to your, like the back cast question, like, again, uh, you know, it's I think one of those underlying points is like, it's neat to see how people rallied around places to fix things, but it's, we have a historical record of all the times we've had to fix stuff. Let's not, let's, let's just not mess with it. Right. So. Yeah, absolutely. So the Alaska engagement program also focuses a lot on the Susitna river. And I think mm-hmm. you know, that I love fishing the Susitna, particularly the little Sioux. Uh, particularly up around Talkeetna. So tell me about the work you did and that the organization did revolving around the Sioux. Yeah. Um, so there's a, you know, Alaska li- loves to big build big things. Um, and there has been a proposal on and off since the fifties um, to build a giant hydropower dam um, in, on the Sioux Sitna river, um, which, you know, this would be larger than the Hoover dam. Again, like terrible, it's a generally a terrible idea. Uh, for the amount of power that the state needs, it would not necessarily meet the needs of the state. Um, you know, there is a sense that like hydropower is renewable energy. To some degree it is. Uh, but w- when you start looking at the impact of the size of the project, um, the question of renewability becomes a, a really a big question mark. Um, so uh, Trout Unlimited has been working closely with the Sioux Sitna River Coalition, which is based in Talkeetna. Um, and that, you know, from 2011 to 2016, that project reared its head and the state was putting a lot of money into trying to build the dam. Um, it's a total boondoggle. Like there's, you know, it's like the bridge to nowhere. Like it's not, there's nothing, it's, it's a lot of money for not a lot of return and the risk that it would cause. Um, and I think there particularly, because as you know, those rivers are, like it's not just the Susitna, but all the rivers that are connected to it, they're all sort of, they're ice driven. And they're, you know, the winter impacts the habitat for all of the salmon to spawn and rear. And so if you put a hydropower dam on the river, you're basically preventing the river below the dam from freezing. And so it's going to mess up all of those tributaries and all of that space where particularly like so much of that coho water is like really, you know, it's brushy. It, 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 they need that weird side off channel stuff. And, um, so Trout Unlimited has been really organizing. I mean, I think what they do so well is organize sportsmen, uh, to understand these issues, uh, and be vocal advocates. And that's everything from, you know, the, the just the average fisherman that to the person that, that fishes a- avidly and is a politician. Right. And so making that connection and making sure that voices are elevated to protect these rivers and always doing so in a way that is situated with the local people. So the Sioux Sitna River Coalition based in Talkeetna, like they were sort of the cornerstone and then it's a, it's a support system for them. Yeah. Um, that, that's, that's good to hear that they're doing that. I, like I said, I love fishing the Sioux Sitna. Um, I think, I think silver fishing on the Sioux Sitna is one of my favorite. Alas. It's so fun. And I, mean, I love, system, Ke- I love, I just... love getting silvers on the Kenai, but you know, there's something about silvers on the Sioux that I just love. Yeah. Yeah, it's so fun. And the Sioux also, like a lot of people don't know, like you go up on the Sioux towards Devil's Canyon, like some of those small tributaries, there's some huge rainbow trout up there and you just have to get to them, right? Uh, But if you get to them, like it's incredible fishing. Yep. Yeah. Big, big rainbows. And also your early season, you get some big kings up there too. Oh yeah. So Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And that's the thing. And like the Sioux Sitna is one of the largest producers of kings left on the planet, right? And why are we going to like put a dam here when we know that kings swim a long ways and uh yeah so, um, I, so i'm yeah. assuming in you saying that i assume that you and ricky geese had lots of conversations over the years down there or up there uh yeah some yeah um <laughs> you know <laughs> yep. ricky ricky's another buddy of mine so uh yeah, yeah he's done a lot of work on the kenai so. yep yep they were an interesting crew, though, because they weren't necessarily opposed to Pebble, which sort of always struck me as 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 unique. Um, but yeah, well, I mean, he shifted from you know being with uh, the Kenai Sportsman Association to uh, having a government position. So uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah. All right, so now you're back in Florida, where we don't have your trout, we don't have your salmon. I know. Imagine about how do you plan to maintain your conservation work? Uh, here in Florida? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I guess I need to figure out how I tie it into Florida. Um, my new job, um, working with True Blue Strategies, so we are a consulting firm that helps campaigns tell their stories. And so I continue to work uh, on the Bristol Bay fight and the next phase of that story. 
um, and uh, working on a couple of other Alaska related issues. This one's not a fish specific one, but there's a proposal for a, another sort of mining district in Northwest Alaska, uh, the Ambler Mining District. And so we're working with a coalition, um, including Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, uh, because there's caribou up here, up there. Um, and uh, so, and it's at the, sort of near the gates of the Arctic, the Brooks Range. Um, so I'm definitely still involved in Alaska conservation work uh, deeply, just be, by profession. Um, also working with some folks on, you know, clean water and climate initiatives um, as well out of D.C., but I gotta, I still have to wrap my head around like what's my place and what's my role in the Florida landscape. So uh, we need to get together and like have those conversations on the water. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, with TRCP, you know, you've got such fantastic people, you know, with, um, you know, Liz Ogilvie and who, you know, mm -hmm. left ASA to went to TRCP and all the others, just a fantastic organization to be working with. And of course, if you, you know, if you're going to get involved here in Florida, I'm going to, I'm going to holler at Gary Jennings over at Keeping Florida Fishing, you know, the subdivision of Keep America Fishing through ASA. Yeah. So, but yeah, absolutely. I've so, reached out to a couple folks with backcountry hunters and anglers. I've got a lot of folks that are, you know, that work um, with them. So I'm you know, trying to make, make some inroads for sure. Um, and I think also just one thing, like it's, it's important to give a nod to ASA and TRCP and backcountry hunters and anglers, like the fight, you know, the fight for Bristol Bay in particular, like, it took a lot of organizations over a long time and all of those entities and so many more. And the, the, the fishing brands and the, the sport fish community, like was really like a massive cornerstone of voices and funding. And so it's just, you know, yeah, it's pretty awesome. And it's always, you have to acknowledge because a lot of hands touched that fight. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think we've seen more of that kind of collaboration um, around the country over the past few years, particularly with the modernizing recreational fishing act mm -hmm. with the re the, you know, the reestablishment of Magnus and Stevens you know, having organizations like CCA, like TRCP, like Congressional Sportsmen, ASA, mm -hmm. I mean, I go down the, you know, this the long list, you know, but we're seeing more collaboration between these groups because ultimately the objective of protecting waters and, you know, also hunting lands, it was, it, we're all on the same page about that. It's just trying to figure out who, whose avenue into that is, is the way to do yep, it. Totally. And usually it's multiple avenues into that. And, you know, so. So you still got your kayak? uh yeah it's actually at my at my in-laws in gainesville so all right i well, never took it with me to alaska i left it here because i guess we knew at some point we would return so. <laughs> <laughs> wow did the whole leave behind thing well you know <laughs> that usually works with dating i didn't realize it was there was the fishing leave behind approach that's right that's right <laughs> Well, we're gonna have to get out and hit Salt Run, or uh, you know, get up to Palm Valley and get get some fish. So uh, yeah, man, for sure. Go out on my boat anytime, also. But Sam, it's always great to talk with you, and I think we need to yeah, start man. to wrap this up. But before we end this, and since we began our conversation with my traditional opening question, I need to end it with my traditional wrap up question. So I want to know what is the Sam Snyder Grail fish, the bucket list fish that you really want to get that's still out there. Oh man. See, if you listen to the podcast, the broadcast regularly, you would have known that was coming. I know. And I, I don't, <laughs> um, I should, uh, I mean, I feel like, like a tarpon is uh, just one of those grail fish and maybe it's, that's cliche. Uh, but I think just like I have spent so much time in cold water, um, you know, cold non-salt water that I need to, you know, again, what, what can I, what can I do here? So, yeah. Well, I think we're going to have to go a little bigger than that three weight you were talking about before. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. It's not going to work. <laughs> not going to work. Well, Sam, this has been fantastic. And I think a tarpon is a very legitimate bucket list fish. I can't thank you enough for being on the Rodcast, but I do want to offer my sincere gratitude to you and all the folks at TU and the Wild Salmon Center and everyone else, including my friends at ASA, for their tireless efforts in protecting Bristol Bay. Sam, thanks so much for being on the Rodcast. Thanks. It's been fun. All right, my listening crew, it's time for a bourbon break. 
And as I often do, this week I'm going to go to Bourbon's next door neighbor and take a gander at another rye. And I'm not going to rye to you. It's a rye that I like. You may recall that back in episode 1.4, the one with the interview with my good friend Joe Hector from Extreme Kayaking, well, in that episode, I discussed Clyde May's straight bourbon whiskey, telling that great story about Clyde May's origin. And then in episode 1.31, the one with the interview with Steve Wolf from Berkeley Fishing, I revisited that origin story and discussed Clyde May's original Alabama whiskey, which, by the way, is so good that it has become one of my regular go-to pours. So I thought I'd continue my exploration of the Clyde May portfolio by picking up a bottle of Clyde May straight rye. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, I am really glad that I did. And now that I'm going to add Clyde May Rye to the Bourbon Break Anthology, you just know at some point I'm going to have to add the Clyde May Special Reserve Bourbon and the Clyde May Cask Strength Alabama Whiskey to the old Bourbon Break at some point. And then I think I'm going to have to get a bottle of each of the five, not open them, and leave them on display on the bourbon shelf. It's like having the entire catalog of an author's books or an artist's records. There's a sense of completion or accomplishment, but you have to actually read them or listen to them, or in the case of the bourbon break, drink from them all. Now, since I've told the Clyde May origin story twice now, I am not going to do that again here this week. Instead, I'm going to encourage those of you who did not hear those first two Clyde May bourbon breaks to go back to episode 1.4 and 1.31 to listen to those bourbon breaks. Just because it's on the shelf doesn't mean you can't go back to a book or a record you haven't read or listened to. And like a good book or a good record, you can always go back and read them or listen to them again and again. Hey, remember when Star Wars came out and the news would report about kids who had gone back to see the film a dozen of times or more times? Back then, the idea of paying to see a movie you had already seen seemed excessive and not typical behavior. Well, of course, now we're used to folks watching movies over and over again. So why not listen to your favorite Rodcast episode over and over? And why not start with the Clyde May Bourbon Break episodes? Indulge yourself. So yes, indeed, Clyde May's Straight Rye. I guess given my admiration for the Clyde May Straight Bourbon and my serious adoration of the original Alabama whiskey, I went into the Clyde May Rye bottle predisposed to a great experience, and I wasn't let down at all. I will say that the Clyde May label is a green and white label, which is supposed to be an homage to the colors of Clyde May's prison cell, and saying that is supposed to be a teaser to get you to go back to those other two episodes to learn the story as to why Clyde May was in prison in the first place. Ba, ba, ba. Now, the Clyde May Rye is produced by uh, Koneka Brands and is outsourced from an undisclosed distillery in Indiana. Now, I will, I will admit, I really don't know anything about grain agriculture, but I do remember that corn and soybeans are the primary grains grown in Indiana, but that rye or cereal rye is what's called a cover crop for corns and soybeans. It's the crop they grow in the winter in the fields where they will grow the corn or soybeans in the warmer months. Now, I have no idea whether the cover crop rye is what they use to make Clyde May rye in Indiana, but whatever rye they're using, it's a damn tasty rye base. Unfortunately, I also don't know the mash bill of the Clyde May rye since they don't publish that information. But I'm guessing that in addition to the primary part of the mash bill being rye, that there's also a fair amount of corn here. And I get that because the nose of the rye is sweet, like sweet corn. There's also a definite rye influence in the nose with a touch of spiciness and a kind of minty and cinnamon aroma with some tinges of fruit. Now, this is a 94 proof rye, and you also get a bit of the alcohol smell in the nose. Now, the Clyde May used to be listed as aged for three years, but they changed that, and the bottle I have says four years, and there's no doubt that the palate of the Clyde May rye is influenced by the charred oak, and you get that great oaky, smoky taste in this rye. There's also that sweetness and spiciness you get with a good rye. The cinnamon is here, but so is some brown sugar, which mingles with the oak to give a nice toasty brown sugar cinnamon flavor. The finish emphasizes the rye and spice with a bit of cinnamon burn. Now, the best part about the finish is that it lingers. It hangs on for a while and leaves a nice glow in the mouth. Now, I'm going to be as honest as I can here. I like the Clyde May Straight Rye but it may not be my favorite rye. It's certainly a rye I plan to keep on the shelf and to drink when I want a good rye, but if it were an option to have it or another rye, it would depend on what the other ryes offered were. 
That is, this is a good rye, but there are a few other better ryes out there. I should say, too, that while I usually prefer to drink my whiskeys neat, I found that a rock or two opens up the flavor a bit and enhances the sweet aspects of the Clyde May straight, straight rye. Also, it just dawned on me that given the history of the Clyde May namesake, prison and all, they should have named this Clyde May's Crooked Rye rather than Clyde May's Straight Rye. But what do I know? And yes, those are my thoughts about Clyde May's Straight Rye. As always, please keep in mind that the Fishing Professor Bourbon Break Reviews are not sponsored. They are not. Nope, 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 nope. The distillers have not sent me samples, though I'd love for them to, nor do they influence my reviews at all. Though, as always, I am open to sponsorship, bribery, and extortion. The bourbons I review are purchased out of pocket, and my reviewers, uh, my reviews are based on the keen sense of bourbon know-how developed over many years in many of this country's finest watering holes, drinking establishments, dives, pubs, honky-tonks, and back-alley speakeasies. Hey, speaking of, let me give a quick shout-out to Whiskey Business in Melbourne, Florida. Now, this is a place I've only been to twice but it's just a mile or so down the road from my folks' house. And someone had recommended that I check it out to try their old fashioned. And it was well worth checking out. In a town loaded with beach bars, many of which I love and spent a good chunk of my teenage and early adult life in, the whiskey business is one of the few serious whiskey bars around. It's a small, cozy bar that seems more like someone's living room than a bar. And hanging out in the comfy leather couches by the window is a great place to try an old fashioned, the ones they boast about. Plus, whiskey business is a clever, fun name. They deserve credit for that. So, some ships are wooden ships, but those ships may sink. The best ships are friendships, and to those ships, we drink. As always, if you have comments about this week's bourbon break, feel free to email me at sid at inventivefishing.com. So rye me a river and join the Mile Rye Club. It's time to get back to the Rodcast. All right, my listening crew, it is time for this week's Top 10 Countdown. And this week, I want to take a look at landing nets for use on boats. Okay, wait, just wait. I know you're reaching for that fast forward button or just going to turn the rodcast off because, yeah, landing nets seems like a yawn of a subject. But hear me out. There are reasons to think about your landing nets. Landing nets ain't what they used to be. Remember those nets we used to get at Kmart or Sears or wherever? The ones made from that silver aluminum with the green nylon net? To make the net out, the mesh net out of, you really didn't have much option as to what you could get. Maybe a short handle or a long handle, maybe a small hoop or a long hoop, but that was about it. Well, net tech has really improved, and now there are a lot of options to think about in selecting what net or nets you have on your boat. Now, there are landing nets with telescoping handles, nets that collapse and fold for storage, different net mesh materials like nylon, rubber, PVC, rubber-coated nylon, cord, and so on. You can get deep pocket nets or shallow pocket nets. There are nets with small space mesh and nets with large space mesh. There are nets with round hoops, oval hoops, square top hoops, or other shapes. There are even nets with measuring markers built into the net so you can measure your fish while keeping them in the water. All of this is to say, nets are worth thinking about. Unfortunately, this is not a tutorial about how to select a net or what to look for in a net component, but I will let you know, oh listening crew of mine, that such tutorials are up for discussion among the Inventive Fishing Administrative Team as a possibility for Season 2 of the Fishing Professor Rodcast. But alas, no such tutorial today. Instead, just a countdown of my top 10 landing nets. Hey, I will say, too, that I'm talking about 10 nets today, and several are from the same companies. But this list of 10 is shrouded by my experience of using nets. It is by no means comprehensive. There are dozens and dozens of other nets and companies I just haven't used. So be sure to look for nets beyond my scope here in this list too. Oh, and let me be clear. Many of the nets in this list are nets I've used on other people's boats. And many are nets I've used or still use on my boat. In fact, to build a little, a little drama and suspense in an attempt to spice up a discussion of landing nets, the net that I will reveal is my favorite landing net. Well, honestly, 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 
I just used that net not 12 hours before recording this top 10 to land no fewer than a dozen fish, so it is fresh on my mind. That said, though, I'm going to practice a bit of net neutrality today and be fair to all of the nets on this list. And I will admit that when I first saw the term net neutrality in the news a few years back, my fish-addled brain really did think there was a big, exciting news in the world of fishing nets. There wasn't. It was about the internet. The internet. I also completely misunderstood that whole Netflix and chill thing and thought people were saying net fish and grill. So let's figure out your net worth and get to counting them down because this top 10 is nothing but net. Swish. All right, coming in at number 10. You know what? I really wanted to include those old school aluminum hoop nets with the green nylon mesh because you've used them so many times. I've used them so many times, but I looked for them online. I couldn't find them and I searched the net for the net. And I wanted to include them because of how ubiquitous they had been in so many of our lives. And frankly, because I landed so many fish with them. And I'm guessing that those of you of a certain age relied on them too. And as such, they deserve our recognition. I mean, they were lightweight, easy to mend. And yeah, they would bend if you hit your brother with them. But they were reliable and functional. And so they deserve to be on this list. But like I said, I couldn't find them. So I don't know who made them or have any information about them. However, I do know that Dotline makes an aluminum hoop and handle landing net that's a pretty close version of those nets of our youth. I should probably not have said that. I'm guessing that netting youths is probably illegal. Anyway, the Dotline net comes pretty close, so I'm going to use it as a surrogate for all of the aluminum nylon mesh nets of days gone by. Now, that's not to disparage the Dotline net. It's sturdy and reliable, and yes, I have one. It uses a one-inch handle and a half-inch hoop made from embossed aluminum. It's very light. The hoop is an 18 by 20-inch opening, and the net is 30 inches deep, so it handles bigger fish as well. And the best part is the price, about 35 bucks. Okay, at number nine, I really like the Wakeman Retractable Rubber Landing Net. And this is another great net listed at a reasonable price of about 35 bucks as well. One of the things I like about this net is its thermal plastic rubber net that reduces getting hooks snagged in the net, and it helps protect the fish from line cuts from the net. You remember getting your hook snagged in that green nylon mesh of the old school nets, and if the hook was through the fish's mouth, then it was impossible to get all that stuff unsnagged. Ugh, what a mess. Well, the rubber net of the Wakeman helps reduce that. I also like the Wakeman's heavy-duty aluminum handle. It's a 35-inch handle, which retracts, making storing it easier. The hoop is 20 by 19 with a 17-inch net pouch. All in all, a solid landing net. All right, at number eight, how about Ranger Nets Tournament Series? Now, unlike a lot of the other companies whose nets are in this list, Ranger Products makes nets. Well, they make a few gaffs and billy clubs, but those are really just modified net handles, right? Plus, the company has a great story in that the company founder, Don Gold, was a member of the elite World War II fighting group called the Rangers. And the Ranger patch he wore became the basis for the Ranger tough quality logo that the company uses. Now, by my count, Ranger makes about 30 types of landing nets. But for this list, and from my experience, I like their tournament series nets. These nets feature a tangle-free rubber mesh that is manufactured to have a flat bottom of the mesh of the mesh pocket so the fish will lay flat on the bottom of the net rather than one end up and one end down the three quarter inch mesh spacing also creates less resistance in the water when you're netting the hoops are made from a heavy 5 8 inch aluminum that is reinforced at all critical stress points they use heavy duty octagon handles and have both non-retracting and retracting handles for easier storage. The handles come in several options. The single-piece non-retracting handles are available up to 6 feet in length, and the retracting handles are available in 8 and 12 foot lengths. The prices range depending on which model you want, but figure to pay between 100 and 130 bucks a piece for these nets. Okay, at number seven, let's go with Frabble's Power Stow, and let's just mark this as the first of several Frabble nets to appear in this week's list. The Power Stow caught my attention because of its foldable hoop and retractable handle that makes it easy to stow. It also uses a double-coated mesh that resists snags and tangles, and Frabble markets, as, markets it as virtually knotless. 
I will say too that the mesh on the power stow resists fraying many the, more than many of the nets I've used. It's also got a heavy duty corrosion free aluminum handle and the sliding component is reinforced. The hoop measures at 24 by 28 and the net lists for about 170 bucks. All right, number six, let's stay with Frabble and point to Frabble's Trophy Hall Predator Landing Net. This is a great net that really took a look at how net handles are designed. This net came on the market in 2020, and it really does reinvent the interaction between the handle and the yoke to equalize pressure along the handle and the connecting point in the yoke, which you know really is the weak point in all landing nets. This net relieves the pressure at that point. It's got one of the largest hoops I've seen at 27 inches by 30 inches, and it uses a flat bottom mesh bag design. I also like that the net has this triangular D-ring built into it that you can use for hanging the net when you're not using it rather than hanging it by the hoop. It has a reinforced 72-inch sliding handle, and it lists for about 175 bucks. And that brings us to the middle. And here I am stuck in the middle with you. So let's give props to Bubba's Carbon Fiber Fishing Net. And yes, when I say Bubba, I mean that company that makes those great fishing knives and that have become so popular among anglers. But yes, they make fishing nets too, including Bubba's Carbon Fiber Fishing Net. This is a heavy duty net rated up to 75 pound fish. The net hoop is made from a really strong aluminum that Bubba's identifies as an aerospace aluminum, and I don't know what that's supposed to imply, but there it is. It uses a PVC-coated knotless nylon netting. Bubba's addresses the difficulty of building a strong yoke by using a die-cast aluminum black chrome yoke that helps resist corrosion and further weakening of the yoke. The handle is made from a carbon fiber, so it's really strong, and Bubba's uses that no-slip grip that they use on their knives as part of the handle design. It lists for about 185 bucks, something like that. All right, at number four, let's go back to another Frabble net with the new Frabble Witness Weight Net, which is part of Frabble's Conservation Net series. And this one, I will admit, I've only used once, but I got a great introduction to it at ICAST 2022 as it won the 2022 ICAST Best of Show and Fishing Accessories category. So I saw it at the Media New Product Showcase event and then at the Frabble booth last year. And it is a really impressive innovation in landing nets. And yes, even as I say that and I hear my words, I wonder if I ever imagined that I would say the phrase innovation in landing nets. But the Frabble Witness Weight Net is just that. What makes it innovative is that Frabble has built in a digital fish scale into the yoke of the net, allowing you to weigh your fish just by scooping it up in the net. The net and the scale weigh fish up to 30 pounds. Why is that innovative, you ask? Because it lets you weigh the fish without handling it, which helps protect the fish. They use a knotless micro mesh netting, which also helps protect the fish by doing less damage to the fish and removing less of the fish's slime. It is a flat bottom net design, and the mesh is coated and uses a mesh guard hoop. All of this is designed to promote safe fish, safe fish handling as part of Frabble's conservation net series. The net also includes a reliable aluminum handle that has a built-in 30-inch ruler for those of you who need fish length more than fish weight for determining whether you can keep or have to release a fish. I will say that when I first saw the witness weight net, the first thing I thought of is how great this net will be for tournament anglers who can make quick keep or release decisions based on the weight measurement from the net without having to remove the fish from the water and use a culling tool to determine what to keep and what to release. So yeah, I like this net and the innovative thinking behind it. Oh yeah, it lists for about 150 bucks. So that brings us to number three. And for that, I want to go to one of the companies whose products I've come to use quite a bit their quality because of their quality and reliability. So for number three, I want to give credit to Ego's Cryptek Slider Compact Landing Nets. Now, let me be clear here. Ego has a full line of Cryptek Slider 2 nets, but I've been using the Cryptek Slider 3 compound, uh, Compact Net, and I love it, both on my boat and on my kayak. 
The compact version uses a 17 inch by 19 inch flat bottom PVC coated mesh net bag, which is great, but it's the slider two handle that makes this net really get my attention. The S2 handle on this net extends from 18 inches to 36 inches, giving you a lot of flexibility and reach. And frankly, I also have the Ego Wade kayak net and the Wade kayak crypto net with the 11 inch handles. And they're great on the yak, but when I go to that 18 inch to 36 inch slider compact net, I gain so much more in reach and leverage that the compact slider is just better tool from the kayak, particularly when I'm fishing offshore and I don't want to have to wait until the fish is literally pushed up against the hull to reach it. The Ego Cryptic S2 is rated for fish up to 30 pounds when it's retracted, 28 pounds when partially extended and 20 pounds when fully extended. And let's face it, the thumb release on all of the Ego retractable nets is ingenious and the grips are great in wet, slimy conditions. Plus, you gotta love the Cryptex coloration and pattern on these net nets. So pretty. Depending on the choice of mesh and such, they list for between 140 and 180 bucks a piece. So yeah, I love my Ego Cryptex slider compact landing nets. All right, that brings us to the number two position. And I got to say, there is so much bad press out there about second place. You know, second place is the first loser, first place or nothing. No one remembers who came in second place in a tournament and so on. But here's the thing. Second place means you are in the upper echelon, that everyone else looks up to you. And in my list, second place is a damn fine place to be because, I mean, it's an endorsement as a way of saying this product is freaking awesome. And so for this week's top 10, no bottom nine plus one, I have to gr give props to a really great all-around reliable, durable landing net in Cast King's Brutus Ford Foldable Extending Fishing Net. This is one of those nets that folds and extends so it can be stored easily, and as great as that is, it's the other parts of this net that make it really a great landing net. The net is made from a 6063 aluminum alloy, which is a really tough alloy that resists bending. Part of the reason it's so strong is that the aluminum is one millimeter thick and it won't bend until after about 44 pounds of weight are exerted on it. And even though it's strong, it's also really lightweight. It's available in several lengths ranging from 16 to 24 inches. The nets are available with three PVC net options or two silicone net options. The folding components use a pushdown switch that is reinforced with four tough screws, making it easy to pull down and retract the net frame. And it comes with a storage bag too. And here's the kicker. Depending on the material and size, they range from 30 bucks to 50 bucks. Just a great net to have on the boat or kayak. And frankly, given their portability when folded, they're great for bank fishing and are great, a great tool to include in a standard wading, camping, or hiking gear pack. All right, and that netizens brings us to my favorite landing net. And as I said, it really is a net that I used just about 12 hours ago, so the suspense is building. But first, a quick recount of the other fantastic nets in this list. At 10, Dotline's aluminum hoop and handle landing net representing all those great aluminum nets we used back in the day. The OG of landing nets. At number 9, Wakeman's retractable rubber landing net. At 8, Ranger Nets, the tournament series. At 7, Frabble's Power, Power Stow. At 6, Frabble's Trophy Hall landing net. At 5, Bubba's carbon fiber fishing net. At 4, Frabble's witness weight net. At three, Ego's Cryptex Slider Compact Landing Nets. At two, Cast King's Brutus Foldable Extending Fishing Net. And that brings me to my number one landing net, the net I netted fish with yesterday and many, many, many other days as well, and with any hope, many days in the future. And that's Ego's Slider 2 Landing Nets. And yes, technically, I suppose the Cryptic Slider Compact Landing Nets I mentioned as number three are a subset of the of these uh, slider two nets, but I'm talking about the full slider two series that gets the number one position. And I have to say too, that the slider two nets are a really dynamic net and tool system with over 30 interchangeable net heads and accessories and handles. Plus they have 19 combined mesh types and hoop sizes. So you can really customize the landing net for your specific needs. Really, the Slider 2 is the most innovative and most reliable net series I've used. And I do have a few of them. As I mentioned about the two I use from the Yak, these are nets I 
that have won ICAST Best New Product Awards, Tackle Tour Awards, Fish Angler Awards. These are renowned nets. They come in handle sizes from 18 to 36 inches and in extensions up to 48 to 108 uh, extension inch reaches. Uh, they're available in hoop sizes from 17 by 19 inches up to 24 by 27 inch hoops. The mesh bags are available in nylon, rubber, rubber coated nylon, PVC coated, rubber, clear rubber, deep rubber, and a guide net that includes a measuring scale in the bag. There are deep bags and shallow bags. And of course, Ego's advanced handle extension technology is really what makes these nets so fantastic. The quick thumb press control for extending and retracting the handles are innovative and reliable and very easy to use. That's in part why I love them on my kayak, because in the limited space, they're easy to open and close. I can keep them short, extend them for a farther reach, and I can do it really with just a push of the thumb. So yes, the Ego Slider 2 nets are my number one landing net for boat use. And that wraps up this week's Fishing Professor's Top 10 list. I hope you found it useful. And for those of you who haven't given much thought to landing nets or those of you who don't have or use landing nets, well, you're just a bunch of netless wonders. And with that, let's get back to casting. Well, my listening crew, we have come to the end of another great episode of the Rodcast. And what an episode it was, one that I wish didn't have to end, but alas, all good things must come to an end. Hey, I want to thank Sam Snyder for that informative interview, and I do urge those of you who want a great fishing book to pick up his co-edited volume, Backcasts. I hope you all enjoyed my bourbon breakdancing thoughts about Clyde May's Straight Rye as much as I enjoyed doing the research for that review. And I hope you found my top 10 landing nets conversation to be somewhat interesting. Before I sign off today, I do have a message for our brothers and sisters out there behind the line. The boat has been fueled. I say again, the boat has been fueled. And that just about does it for this week's episode of the Fishing Professor Rodcast. Be sure to look for next week's episode, which, as always, drops on Wednesday of next week. And I hope you and all the members of my listening crew are out there spreading the word about the Rodcast. And, of course, if you have a comment or a question about anything on this week's show or have recommendations for future Top 10s, Bourbon Breaks interviews, or information about specific fishing-related issues, please feel free to email me at sid at inventivefishing.com. Or leave a reply in any of the comment sections for any of the podcast platforms you use to listen to the Rodcast. Hey, and be sure to follow Inventive Fishing on Twitter, Instagram, and face friend us on Facebook at Inventive Fishing. And be sure to check out all the great video content over on the Inventive Fishing YouTube channel. And you can find some pretty great gear reviews, new product introduction, introductions, and a mess of other great content there. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, I am Sid Dobrin, the fishing professor. Fish on! The Fishing Professor Show is copyrighted by Inventive Fishing, LLC. Any rebroadcast of the podcast without the consent from Inventive Fishing, LLC is strictly prohibited. Fish on! <laughs>